Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for that very generous introduction. My Lords, ladies and gentlemen, is this thing working? Oh, good. I'm very conscious of the honor of being asked to address you as president this evening, but it's also for me a very great pleasure because uh, Sir Walter Scott has been one of the great interests and sources of pleasure in my uh, life for almost as long as I can remember. In fact, the um, first substantial purchase of books that I ever made was uh, a set of the Melrose, a very handsome Melrose edition of the Waverley novels, which I bought or persuaded my mother to buy at an auction sale in Portobello when I was about 10 years old, and they cost 10 shillings. And of course, I grew up in Edinburgh, like most people here tonight, I suppose, and I also went to the uh, high school of Edinburgh, like, uh, as uh, the chairman said, like Sir Walter himself. And that made, I don't know if it still does, but at th that time, it certainly made us feel very close to him. And we were never allowed to forget it, in fact. In fact, I remember an occasion when some poor schoolmaster was driven beyond all uh, possibility of patience, and in a state of complete exasperation, he accused us of failing to live up to the example of Sir Walter Scott. And I remember, I felt at the time, I think we all felt, that that was really rather an impossible challenge. In fact, the more you read Scott, and I think particularly if you read the journals and letters, the closer you feel to him, and the more you begin to feel that, uh, although he lived quite a long time ago now, that he's really quite a close personal friend. And I think that applies to lots of people. You remember last autumn, uh, John Sutherland addressed the club. Uh, he is the author of the most recent biography of Scott, and rather, in a way, an unsympathetic and aggressive biography. Although, as you begin to read it, you begin to feel that the tone changes a bit. So he, when he addressed the club, I had an opportunity of speaking to him afterwards, and I said to him, I had the impression that he'd started, when he wrote this book, he started out with the intention of demolishing a legend. He was going to prove that, you know, that this was all false and that there's no real substance behind this great legend. But that the more he read into the subject, the more he found that he, too, succumbed uh, to the attraction of the, of the personality uh, of Sir Walter Scott and felt a real genuine admiration and affection for him. And he said, yes, that is quite true, that's exactly what did happen. Now, of course, it would be very easy indeed to pr produce a long list of people from many countries who have uh, felt the same way and expressed great enthusiasm for both the man and his work. Goethe, Balzac, Pushkin, Manzoni, Byron, and so forth. For about a hundred years, he was the most popular, admired, imitated, and influential writer in the world. This widespread popularity is by no means dead. Not long ago, at a conference of international pen, I met a Hungarian who had written a book about Scott. He sent me a copy of it afterwards, but since he's a Hungarian, I haven't been able to read it. <laughs> and he's also working on a new set of translations of most of the novels. And at about the same time, just a few years ago, you may remember this, uh, at the time when Glasnost was just beginning to break up the Soviet Union, uh, Frank Dunlop invited a party of uh, theatre critics, theatre directors, uh, editors of magazines and newspapers uh, to come to Edinburgh during one of the festivals. And I think it was in the Lyceum Theatre on the stage they had a, a discussion uh, about what was going on at that time in the Soviet Union, which until then was the Soviet Union. And one of them, who was uh, the editor of a literary magazine with an enormous circulation, a circulation in the millions, said that uh, because at that time um, book publication in, in Soviet Union was in a curious situation that as soon as books were published, they were seized by the public and disappeared within a few days because they were publishing fewer books than people actually wanted. So this magazine conducted a poll among its readers and said, what author would they like to see reprinted? And he said, by far the easiest winner Speak the head of anybody else was Sir Walter Scott. So that international reputation is by no means dead even yet. Now, I noticed uh, quite recently, you remember Middlemarch was a, a television serial not long ago, 
And at that time, I, was, uh, I, I read Middle March again, and uh, I noticed that one of the characters in there was described as reading aloud from that beloved writer who has made a chief part in the happiness of many young lives. The volume was Ivanhoe. And in one of her letters, uh, George Eliot said, I like to tell you that my worship for Scott is peculiar. No other writer would serve as a substitute. It is a personal grief, a heart wound to me, when I hear a depreciating or slighting word about Scott. Now I feel rather like that myself, and I'm sure that many of us do. But when George Eliot wrote these words, I do not suppose that there were many depreciating or slighting words to trouble her. But if there was a trickle then, it has become a flood. It has become a commonplace, and strangely enough, especially here in his own Scotland, for people who should know better to dismiss Scott with a contemptuous sneer. Very often, there's good reason to suppose that the people who do this are merely following fashion and have hardly read Scott with at all. The aspects in which he's most criticized are among those for which he was most praised in, in the past. The effect of his work on the understanding of history in general and of Scotland in particular, and also of the attitude towards Scotland and the understanding of what Scotland meant, uh, both in Scotland and in the world at large. So there's been an astonishing reversal of opinion about these points. And that's what I'd really like to discuss tonight. Of course, there were those who disagreed with Scott even during his own lifetime. James Hogg, John Galt, and Thomas McCree thought that Scott and old mortality had been unfair to the Covenanters, although Scott himself responded with a spirit of defense. Hogg, who knew Scott well, said that the only foible that he could ever discover in his character was a too strong leaning to the old aristocracy of his country. Lockett, in effect, agrees but offers an explanation. A historical name was a charm that literally stirred his blood, but not so a mere title. On the other hand, Lockett also tells us of an estate worker at Abbotsford who said, Sir Walter speaks to every man as if they were blood relations. I do not think he could have written the novels if that were not so, because they depend on a deep understanding of people of all classes and descriptions. The best passages are in the Scots speech of ordinary men and women, and they, like Ginny Deans and Eddie Ochiltree, are among the most admirable characters. This was, I think, entirely conscious and deliberate on Scott's part. Lockett, for once, tells a story against himself. When Scott reproved him for an apparently condescending remark and said, Scott said, I have read books enough and observed and conversed enough with the eminent and splendidly cultivated minds, too, in my time. But I assure you, I have had higher sentiments from the lips of poor, uneducated men and women than I, ever yet, than I have ever yet met with out of the pages of the Bible. Scott's first biographer, George Allen, who published The Life of Scott in 1834, noted this contradiction between Scott's weakness for the old aristocracy and the fact that his heart, as he says, was evidently with the great mass of society. This contradiction extended to Scott's political allegiance, of which Allen clearly disapproved. Scott, he said, had thrown himself with the blind vehemence of youth into the ranks of the British Tories. And I'm quoting, I emphasize, uh, with the blind vehemence of youth into the ranks of the British Tories, the most narrow-minded politicians of the age, dogged adherence to what was established, be it right or wrong, deep, bitter, and enduring hatred of every opponent was what they required. Scott, as one of my predecessors in this place, Malcolm Rifkin, reminded us three years ago, certainly regarded himself as a Tory. He explained this with disarming frankness in one of his letters to Anna Seward. I was not only very early disposed to what has been called Tory principles by the opinion of those whom I respected and was brought up to respect, but the favors I received, the intimacy in which I lived with many of Lord Melville's family, was founded as much upon attachment to their measures in 1792 and 93 as to gratitude for the favors received at a time when they were truly valuable. 
Of course, this Tory party was something very different from the Tory party of today. It had started as the party of the Jacobites and of the opponents to the Union of 1770. By Scott's time, it had become a machine to reward political support by appointments and other favours. Perhaps in that respect, things were not all that different. Unlike the modern party, however, it was highly resistant to any change in the established order. Scott was generally in sympathy with that, both by instinct and philosophy, although he was also fascinated by the new. I think it was Virginia Woolf who remarked that he may have been the last minstrel, but he was also the first chairman of the Edinburgh Oil Gas Company. <laughs> the other points in George Allen's description of the Tories do not apply to Scott at all. He was certainly not narrow-minded, and hatred was alien to his nature. In the same letter to Anna Seward, he went on to say, I am candid enough to esteem the principles and to cherish the friendship of many whose political opinions are different from my own, because I know they're adopted from an internal conviction. When it came to a question of the interests of Scotland, he was always in favor of all parties standing together, as he advocated in the Malachi letters. So Tory and Whig, he wrote in his journal on the 21st of January, 1826, may go be damned together as names that have disturbed old Scotland and torn asunder the most kindly feelings since the first day they were invented. Lockhart, in the conclusion of his biography, summed up Scott's political feelings in these words. The love of his country became indeed a passion he would have bled and died to preserve even the airiest surviving nothing of the antique pretensions of Scotland. Whenever Scotland be considered as standing separate on any question from the rest of the empire, he was not only apt but eager to embrace the opportunity of again rehoisting, as it were, the old signal of national independence. Scott himself, in language very reminiscent of Robert Burns, spoke of his Scottish feelings prejudices, if you will, but which were born and which will die with me. He used another phrase of Burden's when he urged Alan Cunningham to undertake more ambitious literary projects for dear old Scotland's sake. This was the spirit in which Burns collected Scottish songs and Scott the Border Ballads, a tribute, as he said, to a country once proud and independent. Both Burns and Scott deeply regretted and resented the Union of 1707, and Scotland's loss of independence. Both were determined to resist, as far as they could, the erosion of the Scottish identity. The collection of the songs and the ballads were part of this resistance. So were the Waverley novels. And very obviously, and, and more politically, the letters of Malachi Malagrata. I shall always be proud of Malachi, Scott wrote in his journal, as having headed back to Southern, or helped to do so, in one instance, at least. Burns and Scott agreed to in their understanding of the means by which the Union was brought about. Burns in their brought and sold for English gold such a parcel of rogues in a nation. Scott, in the chapter on the Union in his Tales of a Grandfather, where the strength of his feelings are clear from the vigor and passion of the language. The Scottish nation, he says, regarded the Union as a total surrender of their independence by their false and corrupted statesmen, despised by the English and detested by their own country. He asks whether the descendants of the noble lords and honorable gentlemen who accepted the bribes would be more shocked by the general fact of their ancestors being corrupted or scandalized by the paltry amount of bribes. In the whole of the 19th century, this chapter is virtually the only honest account of the Union transaction. In that century of the British Empire, anything which questioned or discredited the Union was unwelcome and by general consent suppressed. That is why this aspect of Burns and Scott has been largely forgotten. It was not so in Scott's own time. When Robert Peel walked up the high street of Edinburgh in August 1822 through the crowd gathered for the royal visit, he said that Scott was everywhere recognized, and the reaction of the people first gave him a notion of the electric shock of a nation's gratitude. The same word, gratitude, 
was used by Lord Meadowbank at the dinner in the assembly rooms in George Street, at which Scott first publicly acknowledged that he had written the Waverley novel. We owe to him as a people, Meadowbank said, a large and heavy debt of gratitude. And he explained why. It was due to Scott that the fame of our ancestors, who fought for independence and liberty, was no longer confined to Scotland. He it is who has conferred a new reputation on our national character and bestowed in Scotland an imperishable name. Lockhart, in Peter's, Peter's letters to his kinsfolk, said much the same. The generation of Hume and Smith had produced a literature of powerful thought, but it had ignored Scottish history, the national character, poetry, and feeling. The folly of slighting and concealing what remains concealed within herself, Lockett continued, is one of the worst and most pernicious that can be set a country. Scott had ended this. He had grappled boldly with the feelings of his countrymen. He was, Lockett concluded, the sole saviour of all the richer and warmer spirit of literature in Scotland. Of course, Scott was not alone. Ramsay, Ferguson, Burns, and in Scott's own generation, Bolt and Hogg, and many others, all made valiant contributions. A nation which loses control of its own affairs depends for its survival on its musicians and artists, but above all, on its writers. Scotland has been fortunate in this respect, and among them, Scott has been an influence of prodigious force. It is wholly appropriate that in Princes Street he has the grandest monument ever erected to a literary man. The theme of gratitude for Scott, for his contribution to Scotland, has continued. When Lord Coburn heard of his death, he wrote in his journal, Scotland never owed so much to one man. Several of uh, my distinguished predecessors have noticed that agreement. Harold Macmillan. For Scotland, he achieved achieved two great ends. He made her people and her history known in every part of the civilized world. In addition, he made Scotland known to herself. Alexander Gray. What Scotland owes to Burns and Scott is beyond all computation. We cannot say that this is still the universal view. I'm not speaking about his literary reputation either among readers or critics. In such a matter, there are fluctuations of fashion and taste. Hugh Walpole, in the Times Literary Supplement of the 3rd of April, 1938, said that Scott's glorious position in critical estimation has lasted for more than 70 years until the early 1900s. But in 1938, he occupied a lowlier place than will ever be his again. Walpole was probably thinking of the notorious passage in E.M. Foster's aspect of the novel, first published in 1928, where he said that Scott had a trivial mind in a heavy style. He cannot construct. He has neither artistic detachment or passion. And how can a writer who is devoid of both create characters who will move us deeply? I am willing to concede that Scott, sometimes in English, but never in Scott, has a heavy style. But all the other points are the opposite of the truth. I need not detain you in replying to any of this, because there has... This has been done to great effect already by many writers, David Cecil, Donald Davy, Virginia Woolf, Duncan Forbes, and above all, by another of my predecessors, David Dykes, who I think is the only of my predecessors who actually did the job twice, and is going to be speaking to in a few minutes. His brilliant essay, Scott's Achievement as a Novelist, first published in 1951, has done more than anything else to re-establish in the highest rank of critical esteem the nine novels set in Scotland in the hundred years or so before Scott's own time. Waverley, Guy Mannering, The Antiquary, Old Mortality, The Heart of Midlothian, Rob Roy, The Bride of Lammermoor, The Legend of Montrose, and then Johnson. And it gives me great pleasure just to read the names. What I want to discuss is something rather different. Why is it that the qualities in Scott which excited the gratitude of his countrymen in the past now seem to be either disregarded or forgotten. I take as an example the following passage from the recently published Encyclopedia of Scotland, edited by John and Julia Kay. Regarded in his own day as one of the greatest of writers and rewarded with great wealth and a baronetcy, he was later seen as venal, and his successive novels merely romances, repetitiously re reworking established motifs and perpetuating 
deluding myths about Scottish history and nation history. Unfortunately, they do not tell us what myths they have in mind. To be fair to them, I do not think that the editors intend this to be a statement of their own views, but as a summary of the current attitude among the public at large. If they are even approximately right, it is clear that the public has been very badly misled. The allegation about venality is a red herring, which is not worthwhile to, to pursue, but the points about history go to the heart of the matter. One of the earliest references that I've come across to the idea that Scott's influence has been harmful and not beneficial was from an unexpected source, a lecture which W.P. Kerr gave at the Sorbonne in May 1919. I should say quite a lot about W.P. Carr, but I won't be telling you about it at the moment. But anyway, what he said was that those who suspect and blame Scott's work because it is reactionary, illiberal, and offensive to modern ideas of progress, and I may say that that wasn't his own opinion. Uh, the spokesman of this party, he said, was Mark Twain, and he referred to Twain's Life on the Mississippi, which was published in 1882. This is the book in which Twain denounced Scott as impeding the ideas of the French Revolution of liberty, humanity, and progress by injecting what he calls Walter Scott's Middle Age sham civilization. He says that Scott had so large a hand in making the southern character of the United States that he was in great measure responsible for the Civil War. This was all due to what he called the pernicious effect of Ivanhoe. A single book, he said, which had done as much harm as Don Quixote had done good. This is the allegation of the harmful influence of false history at its most extreme. But Twain does not refer to Scotland in the recent past, but to Ivanhoe in the Middle Ages. Even so, I suspect that many people were influenced directly or indirectly by denunciations like this and assumed that it applied to the whole of Scott's work. Ivor Brown, in a book published in 1952, said that if it was true that nobody had read Scott nowadays, the fault lay largely in the classroom. He said that the wrong books were chosen and they were wrongly used. The books he mentions were Ivanhoe Again, The Talisman, Woodstock, and Quentin Derwood. Any writer who writes a great deal produces work which is not equal to his best. As we all know, Scott's later novels were produced under great pressure and were far from his best. Virtually all contemporary critics agree that his finest novels are the nine set in Scotland and in the recent past. They are also, as it happens, those where Scott made a positive contribution to our understanding not only of the Scottish past, but of the nature of the historical process. They are novels and not history, but they give not only a vivid but a fair and penetrating view of Scottish life at the time. Nothing could be further from the living myth. It may be that some people have turned away from these nine novels because the best passages are in Scots. I remember reading an essay by B.S. Pritchett in which he said that English distaste for Scottish speech had finally hardened into complete rejection. If that is so, they are missing a great a lot. In Scotland, we are more fortunate because the Scots language is in itself a source of a particular pleasure which no other language can provide for it. Some great historians have spoken very highly of Scott's influence on the understanding and writing of history. Thomas Carlyle, for instance. These historical novels have taught all men this truth, which looks like a truism, and yet was as good as unknown to writers of history and others till so taught, that the bygone ages of the world were actually filled by living men, and not by protocols, state papers, controversies, and abstractions of men. History will henceforth have to take thought of it. It is a great service, fertile in consequences, this that Scott has done, a great truth laid open to us by him. And George Macaulay Trevelyan. He did more than any other professional historian to make mankind advance towards a true conception of history. For it was he who first perceived that the history of mankind is not simple, but complex that history never repeats itself, but ever creates new forms differing according to time and place. Walter Bagehot commented on Scott's grasp of economics, and in particular on the account of economic conditions in both the highlands and the borders, which will be found in the novels. 
He said that they showed a digestive accuracy and theoretical completeness, and that you might cut paragraphs even from his lighter writings, which be thought acute in the wealth of nations. Statements like these are impressive support for the view that Scott, so far from distorting our ideas of the past, in fact enlarged and deepened it. Those who tell us that Scott constructed deluding myths about the Scottish past are seldom specific, but a few exceptions. He is accused, as though it were a crime, of persuading the whole of Scotland to adopt tartan and the pipes as national symbols. There's some truth in this because of the effect of the visit of George IV in 1822 which Scott's stage managed, and while Highland chiefs and tartan played a very large part. So Scott was guilty in this respect, but guilty of a very important achievement. The tartan and the pipes are wonderful and potent symbols which we should cherish. They also mark the reconciliation of the lowlands and the highlands, which, to quote Trevelyan again, has united us in a common national pride ever since the days of Sir Walter Scott. Another and more serious charge is that Scott took an essentially defeatist view of the Scottish past, summed up in Red Gauntlet's famous remark at the end of the novel that the cause was lost forever. Hugh McDermott discusses this idea in his book Lucky Point, although he blames critics like Herbert Grierson and Edith Muir rather than Scott himself. McDermott also recognized this con- inconsistently, perhaps, that Scott's, res- that Scott's resistance to anglicization leads on naturally, as he said, to the separatist position. Recently, the theory of defeatism has been more fully developed by Murray Pittock in his book, The Invention of Scotland. He suggests that Scott deliberately made use of the theme of Jacobitism because his defeat could be conveniently conflated with the defeat of Scotland as a whole. He says that that Scott loved Scotland, but only if it was faithfully confined to the past. There have been one or two other similar theories. Nicholas Philipson, to my mind distorting the evidence, has suggested that Scott transformed Scottish nationalism into an ideology of noisy inaction. Colin Kidd said in a recent book that Scott realized that civil peace and social harmony depended on diffusing the nation's past. None of these assertions are supported by very much in the way of arguments and illustrations. I must say of all such theories that the authors of them have an idea of the character of Walter Scott very different from my own. If they can believe that he was capable of anything so Machiavellian, devious, and anti-Scottish, and without a word about it in any any of his letters or in the journal. Scott was a Jacobite, partly, as he says himself, because of family tradition, and partly for the reason which he ascribed to Robert Brand. No Youth of warm imagination and ardent patriotism brought up in Scotland at that time to be anything else. Jacobitism was an expression of Scottish patriotism and of a desire to escape from the Union. Of course, Scott realized that it was dead as a practical policy of restoring the Stuarts of the throne. In that sense, the cause was indeed lost forever. But the cause of Scotland was not lost, and Scott was determined to devote his talents and energy to fighting for it. If you have any doubt about that, you need only read the first two letters of Malachi Malagrata, which were among the most passionate statements ever written of the value of the Scottish identity and the need to assert it. Let me end by reading three or four sentences from it. What are we esteemed by the English? Wretched drivelers, incapable of understanding our own affairs, are greedy really peculators unfit to be trusted. On what ground are we considered either as the one or the other? For God's sake, sir, let us remain as nature made us, Englishmen, Irishmen, and Scotsmen, with something like the impress of our several countries upon each. The literary critics have restored Scott's literary, Scott's literary reputation. I think it is time now to reassess his great contribution, not only to the understanding, but to the survival of Scotland as a nation. I am sure that this will lead to the conclusion that Lord Coburn was right when he said that Scotland never owed so much to one man. In that spirit, I ask you to drink to the memory of Sir Walter Scott.